Nope. I'm just going to keep talking. Maybe you can hear me. We are streaming. Hmm, we can't hear you, now. Scott, for some reason. Uh, okay, Emro is now uh, available to join. I'm joining. Okay. Hey, there's Frank. I can see. Frank. And uh, Scott goes. Ooh, some feedback there. Yeah, I can hear. No, but you're hearing yep. over my iPad. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, maybe. Turn off your mute your system. We'll see the Scott, do you hear it? I can hear you guys. Yep. I think we can almost hear Scott then, didn't we? Or is that through some? Maybe, maybe, maybe. You no, we're me. not hearing you. <laughs> I hear him very faintly. I heard him laughing. You hear me? You hear me yeah. here? Yeah. What about now? Is that through your computer or is that through here? Hey, hey, testing. You can see my I, little, I hear you. My little meter is here moving. Yeah, we hear you. Okay. Okay, right, so let me just start. turn. Okay, so talk again, Scott. Hello, so hello. Oh, there hello. we go. Testing one, two, testing one, okay. two. Okay, we see, see and hear you now. All right. You won't touch anything for the rest of the day. <laughs> That's okay. You've never done this <laughs> Okay. All right. So now we have a promotion issue. We have to promote somebody. It's really faint. Tom, did you just turn him down? I, I haven't touched anything. So kind of I can there. confirm he didn't oh, touch anything. <laughs> there you go. That's good. All right. So testing. Reason, testing. You testing. You need to turn the volume up. Do it on the computer thing there. Yeah. I'm doing it. Yeah. 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 Do that. Okay. No, Is that better. People complain. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. I hear you loud and clear. Very good. And uh, so I don't know if, the only, uh, yeah, Hanan, if she can come back. Real attendee. Yeah. <laughs> so Martin, the, we have the, Maybe she'll come back. Maybe she'll come back. And I will uh, WhatsApp her to come back. Yeah. We have the uh, together. Mm. Do you have your cell phone with you? I do. do you want me to make you host, Tom, so that you can promote her? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, I'll give you my number. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see. I bet I even have you in my contacts. Let's see here. Okay. Um, go ahead. Uh, 301. 301-514-514-1283. Now, the problem is I'm going to have that. And so in the future, when I That's need okay. you. Okay. Thanks, Fred. That's okay. That way you don't have to get up and run down. All right. Okay. Just give me a call. Thank you. So this Albright Foundation that you work for, <clears throat> where is the headquarters? Where in DC. In DC. Oh, so that's why you, you're here. Yeah. Because you live around here. Yeah. 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 Well, the most of our work is remote these days. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> yeah, the pandemic, uh, you know, was terrible for the world to deal with, but for healthcare and IT, it was a, a eye opener. Telemedicine is here to, you know, gangbusters. It's uh, it's the future. We all are going to stay at home. Hey, Hanan, I think if you speak now, I'll hear you. If, well, compared to, yeah. Hello? Hey, there you are. Even, even hard things uh, finally happen, right? So I'm glad so, it's working now. Mind and eyes have been open. Okay, guys. Hanan's with us. We're going to begin. So you'll have to carry your conversation somewhere else. <laughs> Well, Hanan, so, so sorry that um, 
you didn't get to share much this morning, uh, but we've got a couple friends here with us, and of course we're recording, so we'd love to you to talk about um, clinical engineering any way you would like for Kuwait. Um, you know, the three questions you recall that we asked were, what's changed with clinical engineering there the past couple of years? Uh, what new opportunities are there to operate with the Minister of Health and what's kind of unique about clinical engineering in your country maybe versus other parts of the world? So we'd love to hear you tell all that. Okay, let's just start. Uh, first of all, uh, so many things have changed, you know, over the past couple of years. Uh, it's a true, we are not realizing our potential, but nevertheless, you know, uh, we cannot deny that we have contributed a lot to the field, even if we are not recognized as a potential partner and a key decision maker. Um, in terms of when it comes to continuous education and technical training, uh, I must say I'm very glad that the Kuwait Association for Biomedical Engineers and IEEE MBS Kuwait chapter is the only place in Kuwait where clinical engineers, health technologists, uh, imaging technologists, physicians, even nurses, pharmacists learn about, you know, healthcare technology management, latest technology advancements in healthcare and so much more hospital design, uh, procurement planning and so on. Um, we, we do have so many hopes and aspiration as well. Uh, but again, we, we are not utilizing our potential you know, to the greatest. Uh, I think at the moment, especially when COVID, so many people recognize the role of uh, healthcare technologists, biomedical engineers, uh, but we do have a, an important issue that we need to tackle, which is the credentialing system. Because as a small nation, we don't have enough for human resources available. That's why we collaborate with the professionals from different parts of the world to come. We invite them to come and work in our country. But these people are not necessarily have uh, gotten the training, the proper training. And we have people from different background, uh, different level of competency, working together in one place, uh, which is a big challenge to the Ministry of Health or even a private hospital as well, because in this case, you cannot standardize care. Uh, that's why we think that we need to focus our potential in that area. And because I'm from the Gulf region, I can say that the my other colleagues are from the Gulf, Gulf stage, they share the same concern because we, again, small nations with a small number of population and we invite so many people from different backgrounds you know to come and work in our countries what what would be a way to you think have a gatekeeper for that in other words they can you know i mean i know the ministry is probably you're gonna or the the government entity whatever that invites all these people in with a variety of backgrounds is there you know is there any sort of thing that you know, a, a certain qualification that they would have to demonstrate, do you think? Is there some way to do that? Well, at the moment, uh, people just, they have to turn in their documents and they have to show that they, they have graduated from accredited universities. But even if they have graduated from accredited university, that doesn't mean that they have the optimal... Right kind of experience, or, maybe. Or the uh, optimal competencies. Um, we have so many people who have passed all their classes, but still, when you put them in the field, they don't know the, the very basics. Uh, and we are well, struggling. With that. I've got a crazy idea for you. Let me tell you my crazy idea. Um, Go ahead. You know, you've heard us talk about all these certification things and credentialing things, and I know and sometimes we listen to you well, sometimes we don't listen to you too well, and you know that. Um, but so who's got an active program that 
I think is very relevant. And the answer is India at the moment. I don't know, you know, what the relationship between, and maybe Dr. Coley here in the room does, but um, our colleague Jaitinder has these five certifications. And Hanan, have you heard about those? Or am I telling you something you haven't heard? Well, I heard a few words, but I'm not sure if I know the complete picture. Well, and so, so this is something very people. active that I think 1,300 people there have in his country has gone, gone through. And so there's a training period and it's around, you can get sort of, there's five certifications and there's one as a biomedical engineer hospital. So let's, let's say this is clinical engineering certification slash training. So that you take the training and you get certified if you pass the test. And then there's one called biomedical engineering uh, maintenance. And that's really probably more for biomedical equipment technician on average. And so you take the training, if you pass the test, then you're certified. And I, you know, I think there was some experience required as well as just taking a test and passing and taking some specific training for a period of time. And then a third one is around qu um, quality assurance biomedical engineer, a fourth one is around project management biomedical engineer, and the fifth one is around um, biomedical engineer manufacturing, so you, so that you work for industry, perhaps. Um, and so these are, let's say there's certain criteria to get into it, you know, maybe the edu right educational background and ex experience, and then you take some specific, maybe sort of final training, maybe, I don't know, that six months or more, and then you get that certification, then you enter a registry in that country of people qualified for you know job opportunities, public or private. But in other words, I don't know the, and once again, I have a uh, uh, Indian American colleague in the room that's pretty smart about these kinds of things. How, how hard would it be to accept people from the Middle East, North Africa region to, do you think through Jai Tinder's program? Or is that even uh, feasible or a good idea? Educational institutions in India get foreign students all the time, and I think certification would be a, a very easy thing to actually uh, make available to other parts of the region. So what, you know, I wonder if Kuwait and, and, and by the way, Jaitinder is giving the Grand Challenge keynote on Tuesday morning, Hanan, and he, one of the things he's going to say is we need to click create these global and multi-regional coalitions mm -hmm. around certain things. You know, I wonder if, you know, I wonder if there could be a pilot between Kuwait and India about, you know, sending people through this process to assure their competency. So there's an opportunity here. Uh, she can hear you maybe through the... Can you hear me, Anand? Yes. Yeah. So, so there are a number of health institutions that are India-based that have presence in the Gulf region. A lot of... Uh, uh, so, so, the, so they may be able to bring the program to Kuwait. Exactly. Point. Exactly. So I, I think the seeds of cooperation already uh, exist, or the roots of cooperation. I think this is one of those areas where we think about health system strengthening. How do we begin to upskill and build? Oh, resilience? Because, oh, by the way, the individual talking was one of the principles for the Arab Health Conference and series of conferences. So uh, he's, you know, you've been in the U.S. a long time, so you know. We'll call you a U.S. guy, even though you have that ethnic background. My point is, you you know a lot of stuff, and you're connected to a lot of people around the world. This sounds like one of those times when we could do something. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think Hanan. I think this is a, certainly a topic ripe for conversation. Workforce development globally is an important need, as everybody looks to digitize. Uh, so whatever we can do to broker those uh, conversations, relationships, I think. So, so you, as you sat on the board of Arab Health, what uh, what were some of the things? I mean, does this fit into the framework of things you guys were already talking about in June when you put on that series of programs? Yeah. So workforce development, one of them. In fact, just in a couple of weeks, there's a, a GCC workforce development summit that's taking place in Dubai. Wow. Um, and and you know uh, as the region looks at uh, you know, building resilience in its uh, economies. Uh, one of the areas is how do you actually build skills for uh, folks living in the GCC? Before we get too crazy on you, Hanan, does this, does this sound like something feasible? I mean, what, what, what do you have some questions or do you, in other words, if we had somebody that could go to that summit and or at least, you know, make such a proposal into that summit, is that, does that sound like, like something that would be good? 
Uh, well, we always welcome any sort of collaboration and we do recognize um, as a relatively young big group, it's true that we started in 2006, but nevertheless, we remain a young big group. Uh, we lack resources to establish a certification and a credentialing program ourselves. That's why we welcome any sort of collaboration with any entity. And we hope that we can establish uh, something across the Emro region or even, you know, across different region, because that would facilitate uh, exchanging biomedical engineers between Kuwait, India, Pakistan, or any uh, other country within the region. And part of what you're saying is you've been, in, you've been a exper very experienced practitioner uh, for many years yourself, even though you're still young. Um, but also you see that you see the value of this across multiple countries, not just Kuwait is what I think I'm exactly. hearing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So Tom, a thought came up from this morning's conversation that some regions <clears throat> have um, many interested people in clinical engineering and educational programs to educate them, but the healthcare system hasn't bought in. So those young people don't have anywhere to go. Um, if Kuwait is looking, if I, bought into the concept of clinical engineering and is looking for clinical engineers, maybe these, you know, there's resources out elsewhere outside the country to, right. you know, to send in temporarily till it's established in their own region. And part of what she's saying is they get people coming in, but they're, you know, wide variability. But right, right. So these puzzle pieces could be somehow knit together in some yeah. kind of smart way. Yeah, sounds great. Where the, yeah. And, you know, and if we were to talk about credentialing and boil it down to one sentence, it's meeting certain minimum requirements of, you know, knowledge and practice. Right. Um, so, I'm so, to, go yeah, ahead, Manish. Yeah, I was going to offer Hanan, I'm going to be the same time zone as she is at in just a couple of days. So certainly if, if she'd like to meet or have a conversation while I'm there, I'm happy to sort of make the introduction yeah. and get the collaboration going. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love that. So it made it worth staying up so late for you, Hanan? What, what what time is it your place right now right now it's almost 11 30 p.m wow. okay. hanan you have my uh why don't i put my email in the chat box yeah that will be great yeah let me and manish um and she is she is exactly accurate that we could get five other countries if not 10 to line up behind this as well so Hanan is a spokesperson, but it's multiple countries that want what we're talking about. So then, but you, you, you guys could get the ball rolling, but yeah. there's a lot of other countries that would come alongside. You have access to chat there? Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna let you guys talk about this moment. Okay, all right. Uh, Hanan, I'm gonna type my uh, email here for you. I'll play. <clears throat> Now, do you see my email there? Mm, nothing so far. Uh, hosts and panelists. I guess I need to do with attendees. Yeah. Uh, you have to do it again, I think. Have to do it again? Okay. Uh, yeah, so go down below and click to see at the very bottom, click on the two. Up on down the screen, all the way down. Okay. I know uh, in that same window on the box. Oh, okay. Post and panels. Yep. Change it. To Everyone. Uh, you see it? Yes, it's there. Yes. Okay. I, uh, thank you so much. And if you use WhatsApp, I will, uh, if you email me, I'll send you my WhatsApp details and then we can okay, connect. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, no, my, my pleasure. I think this is important. Uh, and I think if we can uh, help create uh, uh, linkages and bridges uh, so that, uh, you know, we can activate uh, groups in the regions, I think I think that's that's the way to move fast. Um, and, and, you know, my view is, is uh, if we don't have to reinvent the wheel, uh, you know, it's perfectly okay to collaborate and borrow and build on that. 
because it's 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 such a pressing need right now uh, across the region. Uh, and and I thank you for your leadership in stepping up and representing uh, uh, you know the, the group. So so whatever uh, uh, we can do, uh, we are at your service. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And Tom's back here, uh, so I'm going to hand over the podium to him. All right, Hanan, you know, I think we so, almost so, solved world peace here. No, not really. But we've um, started it down the credentialing line. What What's another area that, you know, that we've talked about during some of our MRO meetings that you think we might should bring up? Um, I see that, you know, uh, BME recognition is very common across all regions. Uh, at the very beginning, I thought that this is, you know, specific to Emro region, but the more that I meet people from different parts of the world, uh, again, I feel that the BME is, they like recognition within the healthcare sector. But nevertheless, uh, Although COVID was not a very pleasant experience to all of us, uh, but it provided us with an opportunity to be heard. And people started becoming curious about numbers, about technology, about how non-medical people can help within healthcare. Uh, younger generation of uh, physician, dentist, pharmacists are interested in coding nowadays, data science, artificial intelligence, digital health. Uh, they see that as, you know, very valuable tools that they can use in order to make healthcare more accessible. And I think this is our game. We need so to I, utilize- I think people. you started talking about digital health tools, right? Yeah, we need. Yeah, we need to, you know, start thinking, investing, and in how to promote ourselves as a solution provider. You know, to nurses, physician, pharmacist, that we can help them deliver the service that they want using technology. Otherwise, we will not get recognition if we keep meet, uh, meeting people. Uh, starting communication with policy uh, makers and so on. We did that, you know, about 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, since 2000. We have been doing this since 2006. But, you know, leadership and policymaker keep changing. And every time we, we start the same cycle with different set of people, and at the end of the day, we are not accomplishing what we want to accomplish. So I think we need to invest in a promoting ourselves, you know, among the healthcare community. Let, let me ask we you need... something quick. Yeah, um, sure. And I want to make sure I'm hearing you and not just hearing what I think I'm hearing. So, so one thing you said is people need to understand what our field has to offer. Um, and, and then I, I cited what I thought you started here, talking about as the digital health example, but you're talking about that and other things we have to offer, right? Not just digital health tools. Exactly. You know, it's not just digital health tools. You know, we can provide a lot. Right. Uh, starting from procurement and hospital planning and design. What have there been? So let's focus on that for a moment. Um, during COVID, have there been unique opportunities around um, hospital planning and procurement related to COVID issues? In other words, is there something we can champion? Re remember, I've got this Arab Health board member in the room here, you know, that might be able to help us get this word out, you know, to a wider number of um, Amenas countries. Well, during well, in other COVID, words, are there are there some huge success stories going on during in well, Kuwait well, during, during COVID? COVID? Yeah, yeah, during COVID because we are you know under a staff and relatively you know the healthcare system in Kuwait well 
it was started in the 60s, but nevertheless, you know, if you compare it, you know, to the UK healthcare system or the German healthcare system, it's just not mature enough. You cannot, you know, compare the level of maturity, you know, of Kuwait healthcare system with, you know, the, U the British healthcare system or German healthcare system or even the Swiss. And add to this, we are under staff and we depend a lot on expect and foreign worker, you know, to yeah. deliver the service and a large number of them, they got stuck abroad because, you know, the airports were, were closed and yeah. there were so many travel restrictions and we had to deliver, you know, we had to face COVID on top, you know, of delivering the regular service and the entire system was under stress. Yeah. So we didn't have the opportunity to sit back and reflect and think, oh, we should have done this or evaluate, you know, the services that we did offer during that period. Uh, but nevertheless, I could say that in each field, whether it was nursing, BME, physician, pharmacist, uh, imaging technologist, uh, physical therapist, everyone was working so hard, you know, to compact the effects of COVID within their capabilities, within their scope of work, and sometimes collaborating with people, you know, from a different discipline, but everybody was working so hard. Now, as we are coming back to normal life, and experiencing the new normal, I think it's, you know, the great time that we invite people from different countries within the region and not necessarily engineers, even, you know, non-engineers like imaging technologists, nursing, uh, pharmacists, if, it, if we can have an access to physicians, that will be great. And we start asking them the question, how would you like to be supported by a biomedical engineer? Or what could a biomedical engineer do for you? Because as of now, we keep complaining. People don't recognize us. People um, uh, don't give us the opportunity to realize our potential. But at the same time, we are not inviting them. We are not inviting the other and asking them about our needs. Uh, we started that in Kuwait. We had, you know, some humble starts, but you know, these starts were not institutionalized. All right. So, so let me we, slow you down just a second because this is this is excellent word from you. <clears throat> so this is what you're saying is decision makers are looking to be able to hear these stories in the right forums, or I mean, maybe this is an opportunity to create. I'm going to, have to get something to drink here in a second, but this is an opportunity to create some forums. There's one right behind you, this mine, <clears throat> where we could tell our stories. And so, once again, I'm talking about the the Arab health mechanism that we have a uh, resource into could help us. I mean, maybe Arab health could create opportunities for us to share these stories. Is all I'm trying to say. <clears throat> the, so we're talking about three things. We're talking about getting into Arab health to be able to per, perhaps transfer the credentialing thing. We're talking about getting into Arab health to create opportunities among decision makers in Kuwait and other Gulf countries around the value of clinical engineering and particularly in COVID. Another thing I wanted to bring up is you reminded us that when the the governments change, um, you know, you have to start again, sort of informing a new set of decision makers. In two doors down from us is there, there's an America's meeting, you know, which is North and South, but we're really talking about Latin America and the Caribbean. <clears throat> and what one of, one of our most experienced colleagues that's in that room would say to that challenge is in Latin America, they, they have the same, they have the same problem. And what they do to create more continuity is have um, strength, 
I mean, the center of gravity, the center of strength around biomedical and clinical engineering in the country is academia. So if you have, you know, an academia, not just education, I mean, nothing wrong with education, undergraduate, graduate, but research centers, sort of centers of excellence around key, you know, skills. And I imagine you, so what, what's happening in Kuwait? In other words, where would the, what's the continuity so that you don't have to train the government people all along? Maybe, you know, is there, is there a partner to come alongside some sort of center of excellence, you know, in the academic world or in industry or something that you could latch on to that would help you inform the government and would have good credibility? Does all that make sense? And what do you think? Um, so far um, in Kuwait, uh, the first BME degree program started last year. Uh, so the first cohort is spent, you know, last year, you know, learning basic science, math, calculus, uh, and so on. They are starting the BME courses uh, this year, I believe. But, but not necessarily a place of great credibility and continuity is what I hear. Yeah, okay. but, you know, so academia, well, I, I, even, gonna, you know, I, well, well, even in academia, there is no, an av there is an avenue for, you know, incubating uh, young BMEs yeah. doesn't exist at the moment because even, you know, the local BMEs, you know, were trained outside Kuwait. So the majority of us were trained in North America, the UK, UAE, yeah. some got well, trained Anand, in I'm going to bring up two people to talk about two related things. One is um, Dr. Shankar Krishnan, you know, the president of IFMBE and a professor here in the U.S., but he's taught all around the world, and he may have some um, MENA resources for you. For us, not just you. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, Good afternoon. It's I fun. have to say, Aline, Aline, Kifil Hal. Hanan. <laughs> Thank you. I'm doing well. Hanan, I said Aline. Aline is different. Kulla Tamam? Alhamdulillah, Tamam. But I had to answer in English. Right? So, <laughs> Actually, yeah, I had to answer in English so that everybody two, would two answer words, understand. I know uh, two persons uh, sitting in front of me know what I mean by uh, those two words. Those two words called. Uh, desert, desert watch and desert storm. Do, do you know these two words? Because you are very young, it sounds like. <laughs> Jeez. Do you know the word desert storm? Have you heard of this? Desert storm. Desert storm, yes, I do. <laughs> oh, because I actually happen to be 250 miles south of Kuwaiti border when Saddam Hussein came to Kuwait. Yeah, I was very, very, very young at that time. No, 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 no. I just wanted to. Okay, so uh, you know, I have to make good connection to say that I know about Kuwait. You know, because at that time, you know, what happened was all the uh, we were told all the medical equipment from the hospitals were taken, including exactly. X-ray units and everything taken from Kuwait. You know, so I'm. I, I was only two hundred fifty miles south of that, unless you stayed there, and we were given one day to evacuate. So, you know, disaster planning, I understand it very well, actually. So I just wanted to tell you, no, let you know. Okay. Second thing, you know, we were actually planning to have, you know, IFMBE, uh, there is a sister organization called IOMP, that is the International Organization of Medical Physicists. We were planning to have a meeting in Kuwait uh, in 2019 before the pandemic. And unfortunately, we could not hold it. And the reason given to us was there was no biomedical engineering society or association in Kuwait. So this morning, when I heard you speak, I was really pleased to hear that you have a national organization. So that's why I asked of my friend, Tom Judd, that I want to speak to you. You know, if you have an association, it is fantastic. I think if you join IFMBE, then we can actually, one of the reasons was they were going to host a meeting of combination of IOMP and mid, uh, biomedical engineers together at this place, you know. So uh, how large is, may I ask you a question? How many people do you have in your association? 
Uh, okay, fully registered people with the you know active membership, we have a plus fifty, uh -huh. uh, but we have a plus two hundred who are not registered. But you know they are still participate in our events, and we are fine uh, with uh, that. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I had to step out for something else. But I heard the word Arab health. I have attended Arab health as well, and I think it is really a good opportunity to get together. And you know, I will get your email from our friend Tom Judd, and you know, I will link you up with our membership committee chair. So we will help you become a member, and we can give you all kind of support you need. Yeah, thank you. Uh, regarding an, uh, the Arab Health, you know, Arab Health is an excellent avenue for networking, especially you know among the MENA region professionals. Mm -hmm. And in 2013. Uh, we did participate as you know the first professional NGO in Arab Health, and we presented the talk. I presented the talk myself, and I started you know talking about you know how as engineers we could reform healthcare because around that time you know reforming healthcare across the MENA region was the big thing, and I showed you know examples uh, from our work and how we plan because. We do plan our activities with the reform societal enhancement mindset. And if you notice, well, I'd love to continue the conversation with you later on. I'll tell you more about you know, our activities and what we do. But the focus of our activity is societal enhancement and the reform of healthcare. Yeah, I do know that in well, Kuwait, yeah. you know, for yeah, the momentum the was, you know, uh, uh, the momentum was very great during the Congress, but well, what happens with normal conferences is that people get ex excited during the Congress, uh, and after about a month or two of the Congress, but you know the momentum, you know, fades out. You know, unfortunately, with time, uh, Adam Health an excellent avenue for networking, but we need to make sure that the networking and the momentum that takes place during Arab health sustain, you know, even when the Congress activity concludes. Yep. Yeah. Now we are actually planning to visit Dubai and we may make connections so we can even possibly meet mm -hmm. over there. Okay. Very good. So we will try to yeah. help you in whatever way we can. And I wish you all the best. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sh shukran. One, half one. We got about 10 minutes left. I'm going to bring up friend, uh, Dr. Manish Kohli you know, who's going to talk not only about Arab health a little bit and how we probably can do something sustainable because he's going to be around a while. He's a young guy like you're a young lady and uh, but also around digital health a little bit. He's the past board chair of HIMSS, you know, 110,000 people working in health IT around the world. Thanks, Tom. Um, Hanan, I think uh, what you said earlier is is spot on the money. Uh, COVID has, despite all the tragedy, created an ex extreme uh, amount of awareness and opportunity uh, that we can capitalize on, and the opportunity to actually create a better healthcare system. We've talked a lot about, uh, you know, networking and and the uh, human capital development, but really, I think um, the time is now also to think about how do we reimagine healthcare delivery. And uh, reality is, is with the openness to doing work remotely, delivering care remotely, uh, we have the ability to envision an ecosystem where uh, we begin to uh, optimize how healthcare capacity is utilized. And as we think about infrastructure build, uh, physical infrastructure build, it's clear that hospital beds are expensive to build. And for us to uh, think about a model where only the most critically ill patients, uh, where uh, complex patients, where surgical patients get care in those facilities because they have the systems in place, but anybody who can be managed in a primary or secondary care level uh, or even home, we really need to be thinking about uh, stratifying the populations and leveraging data and technology uh, that's available to us now to build a model of care, which is uh, 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 more cost-effective, 
but also democratizes access to care for everybody. I think the challenge is, right, um, we spend 10% of the global GDP on healthcare. That's a lot of money. And despite that spend, when you look at the data on quality and access uh, and, and disparities, it's, it's, it's striking. And, and if we are able to begin to address even the inefficiencies in health healthcare, which in, according to some estimates are about 30%, so you think about 30% of the of the 10% of global GDP is is somehow contributing to inefficiency. That's where the opportunity lies. So, for us to begin a dialogue, uh, uh, not at a health system level, not just at a country level, but at a region level, where you can begin to look at capacity planning uh, 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 much more broadly, it makes a lot of sense, especially uh, in the GCC region where the populations are small. And to to justify investments and in, in especially you know uh, tertiary and quaternary care centers, you know uh, you you need to have a strong business case and a clinical case. You need uh, uh, to utilize the investment that's made uh, most efficiently. So yeah. so I I, I think um, whatever we can do uh, as a healthcare community, and I'll I'll be the first to say, you know healthcare is a team sport, and we need everybody. Uh, clinical engineers, nurses, allied health professionals, uh, administrators, and by the way, doctors as well, uh, and patients at the table to redesign uh, healthcare. And ultimately, uh, you know, every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it does. If we can align policy and funding that align with the goals we just talked about, right? More equitable, uh, more accessible care for every citizen uh, in a region and across the world. Uh, I, I, I think many of us in the room, but around, uh, around the world believe that what was uh, seemingly impossible just two years ago before the pandemic is now within reach. The key is going to be creating success stories. So, so Hanan, I, th I think if we can collaborate on identifying it, we, which are the health systems, which are the governments that we need to have those conversations with, and come in with a partnership model. Uh, it's not about you know uh, you know uh, one person uh, telling the other person. It's really about problem solving together. Uh, the pandemic has made us realize. You know, the virus knows no boundaries, knows no culture, uh, knows no difference between uh, religion, uh, skin color, or anything else. Uh, so so we, we have to sort of start thinking about healthcare without borders. Uh, and that means, uh, you know, coming together uh, to problem solve at a regional and a global level, but now looking at digital infrastructure as a key underpinning of achieving that goal. So I, I uh, you know, uh, was a little long-winded, long but uh, I, I, what I feel really excited about, especially the Middle East region, is the pace at which progress happens is, 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 is just unparalleled. You look at any country in the world, uh, uh, I, I would say perhaps China has, 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 has shown uh, the similar amount of ambition in terms of development, but the Middle East region, when you look at Dubai, a 40 year old country and where it is now, uh, you, you know, uh, in, in pictures, decade after decade, you can see the difference um, and other economies are the same way. And with the huge push in Saudi Arabia, Vision 2030, UAE, Kuwait, Bahrain, all over the region, I, I think we have to be in the right dialogues and, 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 and offer the best resources that we can uh, uh, across the world to help problem solve. So, so uh, Arab Health is, you're right, one uh, avenue. There are other forums uh, where discussions happen. The important thing is for us to identify and bring the people. For us to know that Hanan is there, is our champion. Uh, I think is important and thank you for your leadership and what we want to do is 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 really uh, now uh, uh, create those meaningful connections, whether it's IFMBE or GCEA coming, uh, you know, helping you problem solve or whether it's you uh, coming to some other part of the world, uh, helping problem solve. The, the reality is innovation is going to come from the developing world. Uh, uh, that That's just, uh, I think, the popular wisdom these days uh, because the need is so urgent. And if we do things the old way, we may never get there. And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is the telecom moment where we are going to leapfrog in healthcare like um, many developing countries de uh, did uh, in the phone uh, era where they skipped over the entire land-based phone infrastructure and built a mobile infrastructure. And I can tell you when I'm on Zoom calls today, 
I have more problems with participants sitting in the developing world than the uh, in the developed world than the developing world. So go figure. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So Hanan, we know it's near midnight. Um, even though you're young, you're probably going to get tired at some point. So I know I've been throwing some uh, wonderful resources at you the last few minutes, but uh, I want you to be encouraged. And, you know, the global CE community with our friends like uh, Dr. Christian and Dr. Coley, are, are, we're going to be sustainable. We're not going to forget this over the next two months after the Congress. You know, <laughs> we're going to be here and we're going to keep, you know, working with you to make things happen. Thank you so much. I want you to be encouraged here before you fall asleep. <laughs> Can you send my email and let's chat? Yeah. Um, I think Frank already did. Can you put it in now before we end the meeting, if you don't mind, one of you? So we're going to send you Dr. Christian's email, and I think you've already got Dr. Coley's. And wish her all the best. And I know... Uh, so Hanan, any, any last comments? We're gonna end the webinar in a couple minutes, but uh, get ready for our last hour. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad we got to focus on you and uh, Kuwait and and because uh, I, I, not only do we wanna encourage you, but we also um, believe you're talking about, you, you well represent your region, as has been said. Yeah, do you mind if I ask a question? Please. Yeah, what happened to the rest? Because I don't see Riyadh and the other folks. And, and, and a quick answer is, you know, so there was, as you heard me saying before there, let me tell you, um, so, so let me take the encouraging things and answer your question. In terms of registrants for this uh, Congress, uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 uh, MENA countries. Um, of the of the steering committee that was helping for IMRO, one of them is uh, Riyadh Farah, who's just taken this new job in the U.S. Uh, that's you know and had just moved his family to the U U.S. from Lebanon, and you know is things are crazy is what I'm trying to say for him right now. Um, yeah, and then your colleague Tazin in Pakistan, you know, was able to present as you heard this morning, um, and you know, mom of a of a young baby, and so you know. <laughs> She's dealing with home stuff at the moment. Um, but, you know, we did have uh, Huma, who is in the US, as you heard this morning, but represents Afghanistan. We have people from Algeria, of course, your friends, Naveen and others from Egypt, uh, Jordan, Leb you know, Lebanon, Oman, Pakistan, Qatar, Saudi, um, Somalia, Sudan, Tunisia, and Yemen from the region. So we, we've got some strength. They just, this was turned out to not be the best time of day for them to meet. So, I mean, that's as straight an answer as I can give you. But uh, we, we will convene that group. And I, you know, I love some of the practical things we came up with, some of the folks that are attending and listening. Uh, we, we actually came up with some very concrete next steps. Uh, one of them is to perhaps transfer a very good existing credentialing program in India into the region through um, centers that already exist to do work like that in, in the Gulf region and to also create a forum for uh, decision makers in the MENA MRO region to hear more about clinical engineering and how it contributes to health system delivery success uh, through Arab Health uh, through Dr. Coley here who's on their board. So um, pretty exciting stuff even though you know it was lightly uh, represented here. But anyway, with all that said, we're going to complete now, and uh, thanks for your time today. And we're going to uh, close this webinar and open the last one in this room, which will be the one for Western Pacific. There are a few people from that one that are signed in, so maybe you ought to just leave it open and just say we're now starting a new one. Well, I have to close this to start the new one. Uh, are you sure? Yeah. All right. Explain to them what's going to happen. And it's one minute. Sorry, Frank. Yep. So I'm going to end this one. And so if you're in this one and we're going to close it, it'll send you back to the lobby and then come into the W Pro um, program. Thanks. <laughs>